Welcome to the Criterion Chat, a podcast about cinema in the Criterion Collection. Tonight, we discuss Jean-Luc Godard's self-reflexive film, Contempt, released in 1963. Paul is a drifting screenwriter who has been tapped to doctor the script for a new lavish production of The Odyssey, directed by German legend Fritz Lang. Egged on by the chauvinistic producer Prokosch, played with grotesque glee by Jack Palance, Paul takes the job reluctantly. He needs the money, after all, and wants to keep his beautiful wife Camille, played by bombshell Brigitte Bardot, in high style. Camille, too, is drifting aimlessly, trying to find identity in a new and fragile marriage, fraught with temptations. Godard uses the framework of the death of classical cinema to detail the death of a relationship against the backdrop of scenic coastal Italy. Now out of print on DVD from Criterion, Contempt stands as a meta-subversive classic of new wave cinema. So Nate, um, I don't think we've talked Godard yet on the podcast, have we? I'm trying to remember. I don't think we have. Uh, uh, not only have we not talked about one of his movies, I don't know that we've actually even made reference to him. Yeah, I, I thought it was kind of a, a blind spot, I guess, in terms of directors we've talked about. Uh, I guess we've talked about Wong Kar Wai, of course, who's very influenced by Godard. But this this is a film in particular I've come back to several times uh, over the years. It's it's kind of an anomaly. It, it It's one of those films that, on its surface, seems very indulgent and very... I mean, I hate to use the word pretentious, but I think that does apply here at times. I know that's going to maybe shut a lot of people down right away by mentioning that. But I do like this film quite a bit, and I, I'm still trying to figure out exactly why. Uh, there's something about it that pulls me in each time I see it. It's quite alluring uh, in, in its form and its style. And I, I just find it fascinating because of all the layers that are going on. And of course, we'll get into that as we talk here. Um, I, I guess just on the surface, it's uh, up until this point, this is, of course, the largest budget that Godard had to work with. This is a, a co-production with uh, Carlo Ponti, who's a, a major Italian producer. It was um, shot in Rome. And so this is quite a departure for Godard, who, of course, is the darling of the French New Wave and known for kind of the more rough-and-tumble, independent, grittier-type films. And, and here we are with a very lavish CinemaScope production, clearly quite a bit of money on screen. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it, it really doesn't betray Godard's sensibilities. And if anything, he uses it uses this format to really kind of make uh, several statements of irony or just uh, really a self-examination of the state of cinema at this time in the 1960s, early 1960s, but also a comment on his own contributions to cinema and how he himself has been a disruptor. Uh, so I, I, on a different level, I thought it would be interesting to talk about this film, just comparing it to the state of cinema today. You know, I, I think we're really at a a crossroads in, in cinema, not only from a standpoint of um, really the loss of more artistic or independent or smaller films, but we're also uh, really entering a new phase of distribution, right, with with uh, streaming services and, of course, the effects of the pandemic and how that's really going to change movie going, I think, at least for the near future uh, in some pretty extreme ways. So in the context of cinema at the time of the 1960s and cinema today, I thought this was worth talking about. So uh, I'll throw it to you, Nate, just for your initial thoughts on this film. Well, let me just give a very quick little um, disclaimer as I start my, my comments this evening that I have in my lap not a French bombshell like Brigitte Bordeaux, but... Uh, rather, a new Britney Spaniel puppy uh, that I picked up this past week uh, that I figured I'd keep with me while I record here just because he's not yet fully house trained, so I can keep a close eye on him. Uh, so if there's occasionally a little whimper or a little 
scratching or something like that you'd hear on the podcast recording tonight. That would be my new Britney Spaniel, Danny. Uh, so at least he is French. Uh, so there is <laughs> something in keeping with the film we're talking about here tonight. Uh, but just a, a little disclaimer for the recording purposes here. Uh, well, I'd be interested, uh, Matt, this is my first time watching Contempt. It's not my first time with Godard. Uh, I've seen several of his other films. And certainly he is a massive figure of the French New Wave. Uh, and was one of the first examples of a film critic who also was a film director uh, and a screenwriter as well. So the, uh, there's been other people that have come out from Rod Lurie's one that I think of uh, as an American context anyway. But I've never been the world's biggest fan of his, and I don't think that this film really spoke to me. I couldn't. I guess as I watched it for this podcast here, I couldn't tell whether it was way more sophisticated than I thought it was as I watched it, or whether it was even dumber than I thought it was when I was watching it. I couldn't really tell what it was. I felt like I was watching a film theorist's, I, I like, like a visual essay or something like that. Like, oh, this is just my thought experiment about movies or something. Yeah. Uh, because it seems utterly simplistic, not particularly interesting. It, um... It, I, I know the film's based on a particular uh, novel uh, that evidently takes place over the course of several weeks or months even, and they condense this into basically a couple of days. And I think because of that decision, it doesn't play well at all. But I was wondering if, okay, Godard as the film critic, is he, is, is he trying to make a point about how romance stories usually take place over such a condensed periods of time? that they don't make sense themselves, even though emotionally they seem to for a movie. But this one, you know, I don't know. I, I, I had a hard time uh, tr thinking, is this is, is this just a elaborate sort of self-indulgence? Is there actually something that merits this film? I couldn't, I couldn't decide. Uh, so here you say that you like it, but you can't say, you know, why uh, I guess I can relate to the, I can't say why a portion of that, but I also can't say that, Watching this once, I felt that there'd be a value of watching it a second time. At least that's my initial thought on the film. Uh, but certainly, definitely, I was watching this just thinking to myself, you know, I, I obviously, like you said, it was Godard's biggest budget of the time uh, of his career. And just thinking about how, gosh, in the 1960s, this kind of film was celebrated and received not just by critics, but by audiences. Yeah. And how different the whole landscape is today, not just from... The, the studios or from the filmmakers, but also from the audience. The audience is looking for something very different now uh, today. And so this is capturing uh, certainly um, a change of cinematic history in terms of the story it's telling. Uh, but at the same time, it's also, I think, um, capturing kind of an ever-recurring reality in, in movies, which is that things always seem to be changing and some of these creative dynamics are are always at play you know the the screenwriter having the to balance a, a, a producer and a director and excuse me the uh, the need to to figure out how your personal life and your professional life intertwine or shouldn't intertwine and the the predatory nature that we see in Jack Palance's producer of Prokash uh, is is certainly very resonant now I think particularly in the light of the Me Too movement yeah. so it's just a it does have some timeless elements to it, but there's also part of it that felt, I don't know, I can't really say what I think about this movie at all. Well, I, so I, I, I left very confused. Yeah, well, I, I think that's... Emotionally, not like I, not like I didn't get the, what was happening in the story, but just like, like, I don't know how I should interpret this movie. And I think that's a great way to summarize it, and that's one of the reasons why I, I like the film, or like examining it or i guess it's brought me back a couple times is it's very very hard to pin down what exactly godard is doing here and i'm sure there's been books written about it and essays etc cetera, etc cetera. and I, I haven't done a lot of reading about this film uh so it, it's hard for me to have you know a real extensive background from a critical standpoint in terms of saying uh, you know, what is the general interpretation of this film? Uh, but you're right. I mean, on its surface, it's certainly a commentary on 
the filmmaking process in and of itself, right? I mean, we see how all these different players are interacting with each other, the uh, financial ambitions and concerns of the producer versus the artistic ambitions of the director, uh, the clash there, uh, a screenwriter that's clearly not invested in the project and is distracted by his own personal life. So I, on the surface, all those elements seem very um, almost simplistic in some ways, right? But it almost feels like Godard is trolling the audience or even trolling his Italian producers at the time in terms of what he's making here, right? Because uh, you're right to say that there are a lot of mixed messages here. There's a lot of different ways to interpret this. Uh, Godard almost seems to be lamenting the loss of classical cinema through his characters. The you know Paul makes the comment of really pining for uh, the days of Chaplin and and just more traditional cinema and on how that how he feels or how even the film feels that that is dead, but. The fact is, Godard helped usher in that death, correct? So it's confusing to to know what, you know, is he celebrating this change or is he weeping for this change himself? And maybe there's a mixture of both. But that, um, that sense of confusion, that sense of mixed emotion, I think, adds to the film uh, creates layers that are interesting to kind of parse through, but you're, you're right to say that it leaves you feeling confused. You don't quite know what is being said here. Uh, the film is also very much about the disillusion of a relationship, right? And you can compare the disillusion of, of cinema at the time to the disillusion of the relationship and, and make comparisons between those two. But at the same time, Godard also seems to be almost parodying uh, the idea of a relationship film here, right? We have that very... Very much so, yeah. Yeah, that extended sequence in the apartment, that 30-minute sequence or so, that's just really a back-and-forth conversation between uh, Camille and Paul, and, and we see things fall apart in, uh, in a very incremental way. And maybe we should just... I. It's tough. It's tough to to know how to approach discussing well, this film because because point, of all the different layers. Yeah, picking up on that point of it, almost like he's trolling the 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 producers, or just specifically trying to maybe deconstruct. If I can take a postmodernist, uh, which Godard I think certainly could be considered postmodern. Uh, yeah. If I could take a postmodernist's vocabulary here, uh, he. Uh, with his use of the music, the score by Georges Delarue, it's just so melodramatic. So, <laughs> and, uh, and the, you know, I mean, it's yeah, the editing is it, very not strange. Not that it's bad, for it too, but it's yeah. just like it just comes in so blatant and so repetitive. And you think about okay, fil how films were scored at that time, it wasn't that different than this. It was more nuanced in some levels. It was more professional and competent in a certain sense. But it was every bit as blaring and showy as it is in this film, uh, and that you think, okay, he's got to be up to something there with this particular composition, right? Uh, that is just so very intensely emotional. Yeah. <laughs> At times, where you go like, boy, nothing on the screen seems to match the intensity of this particular <laughs> piece. You know, it seems, it's just someone. Standing it's almost there. like you yeah. feel like. Well, obviously, Georges Delarue, is, uh, his, his uh, adagio for strings is famous for being used in Platoon. So his, his music is always, I think, this very highly emotional and um, melodramatic kind of uh, appeal. But, you know, you just listen to some of the, s the scenes where you have it playing. You think, like, I'm waiting for someone to just sh pop up in slow motion and slowly shoot everyone to death in this terrible display of, of, of chaos and, and great tragedy. And it turns out, no, it's just two people sitting there having a conversation in an apartment. You know, it's so it just it's it is like he's definitely trying to play around with conventions here. I don't know if he plays with them successfully or if he if he can master them enough uh, at this point uh, to really do something interesting with them. But it, it does strike me that you're right, that he is trying to play around with and almost 
mock the the genre that he is showing, which might be at the heart of what this this idea of contempt means, right? Of the title, it could be a yeah. du- nuanced thing. The contempt between Camille and Paul, but also perhaps a certain contempt towards the style or genre that he had. I don't know that that Godard has the same kind of weeping that you are wondering if he had. Um, I, it's almost like he's, I think he's in some ways perfectly fine with, with moving forward with it, with the destruction of, of a previous style of filmmaking. Well, you mentioned the music. I, I think that's important to talk about further. I, the piece in and of itself is actually one of my favorite pieces. I love that theme. And it's used awesomely, by the way, in Scorsese, by Scorsese and Casino. In Casino, he uses yeah. a great, uh, yeah. Yeah, I was going to mention that too. It's awesome in Casino. Um, I just love that piece of music. But yeah, it's played to death here, and it, it it seems very intentional. And the the way it's edited is very strange too. Like the music will come up in the middle of one shot and then fade away, uh, very randomly. And it's just like, well, what was that? Well, why why do we need to hear that at that moment? It's almost like we just needed filler for the person to walk across the room, and we just couldn't keep it silent. So let's just bring that back. Uh, but it does create, yeah, like you said, this heightened sense of melodrama. On top of it, famously, the original cut of this film really had no nudity in it, and the Italian producer was quite upset by that, wanted more uh, skin in the picture, very much like Jack Palance's producer mentions that in the film as well and and gets quite excited uh, at the prospect of of that being included in his version of the Odyssey. So it makes you wonder if those were also later editions, the stuff with Palance and the, and wanting this, you know, when he's talking about the, the girl in the, in the dailies and stuff like that, you just, it makes you wonder, was that added in as a part of a joke towards (laughs) Carlo Ponti? Well, you wonder about that, but the, the scenes that do have the nudity seem so elongated and gratuitous and, uh, Again, it just feels like he's trolling the producers in some ways. And they take kind of a more tragic tone to them than something that's maybe meant to excite the audience. But again, that that piece of music is layered over it very heavily. And you have this odd color tinting that comes in and out. And at a certain point, it just it almost feels like a Jackson Pollock. We're just throwing paint up against the canvas and and... Uh, calling it artistic expression. So it, it's hard to know what Godard's true intentions are here. And, and again, that's that's one of the reasons why I find this film fascinating is uh, it's it's difficult to make heads or tails of what we're seeing. But I, even the opening credits, the opening credits are a voiceover, right? <laughs> Which the first time I saw that, I it just seemed so... Uh, Again, it just smacked of pretension, and then you, you had the music in the beginning too. And it, it's like, why? Why is this so dramatic? It's just a simple dolly shot. We're seeing uh, the, a film within a film, where we're seeing a very simple shot being recorded, but it had this, such a tragic overtone to it with the music, and and even the way the um, the voiceover was being read gives this somber, uh, almost funeral like quality to the opening. It's almost a requiem. It's very, uh, yeah, it's just difficult to pin down what the intention is here. But the the opening bit, so Fritz Lang, of course, is plays the director. And I do have to say, his version of the Odyssey looks terrible. <laughs> uh, just the, the production design, these strange painted statues, uh, the... Greek toga that's uh, a plaid it looks more like a, a strange Scottish outfit versus a, a, a Greek. It looks so bad. I was like, <laughs> oh man, I wish this was a real movie we could watch. <laughs> <laughs> so it's supposed to be this lavish, you know, high budget production or whatever is being made and it just looks awful. And I think that's, that's probably intentional too. I don't know. But you never get the sense that this is really an epic film that's being made, even though everyone talks like it is. And that's another thing that's kind of, I find kind of humorous. 
but everything here is very stylized. And I think that's probably one way to look at this film is it, everything is being designed and controlled. Even the, even the apartment, the, the fact that the apartment is unfinished, right? It's being remodeled. There's paint cans and there's ladders around and, and there's a lot of visual little gags that go on during that apartment sequence that are even semi comedic. You know, I think about Paul going through that, that door that is missing the glass. You know, he initially opens the door and then when he comes back out, he just steps through it. And there's one point where he kind of does both. And it's this sort of visual representation of the confusion of their relationship. Um, not to mention Camille at one point, I think walks under a ladder and then realizes it's not a good idea and avoids doing it as she walks back uh, out of the room. So there's all these little bits of foreshadowing suggesting that, okay, this relationship is unhealthy. And, and Paul and Camille, and we probably should just talk about that apartment sequence in and of itself, they seem to have a very superficial relationship from the get-go, right? I mean, you just kind of know that this is not a marriage that's going to last. They, there's no maturity to their relationship. It's very superficial. It's, it's almost like two teenagers that are infatuated with each other. And every little mm -hmm. tick and every little expression and, and word is overly analyzed and, you know, either misinterpreted or uh, interpreted in such a way that assumes the worst or assumes the best. Or it, it's all extremism. And Godard is very, I think, good at representing that, uh, not only from a performance standpoint, but again, visually, you know, just how the the lamp is used in that one sequence or the camera is do dolling back and forth. We're frequently shooting through doorways and uh, walls are, are clearly visual barriers between the couple. And, you know, I, I brought up Juan Corway earlier. He, I, I think he took a lot from this film visually, uh, especially in, in The Mood for Love. You can see uh, some very similar shots uh, in that film that are seem to be directly lifted from this apartment sequence. So I, uh, any thoughts on, on that portion of the film specifically? Well, so yeah, obviously it's the heart of the movie. Uh, and it's, it is impressive that he does manage to block the scene very intricately for a prolonged period of time and make it feel cinematic. One of the things you have in a movie like this is it regularly can feel like a stage play. And it doesn't. It really never does. I always felt like this was a movie, which that is to Godard's credit in terms of how he, he established the characters and, and set it up and then executed the, the staging of a scene because it really is a very dialogue-heavy film. And the cast is about half a dozen people, right? I mean, there's Godard, of course, has a small little role as, a, as the, one of the assistant directors, and Fritz Lang is one of his, his icons, is one of his great heroes, as a uh, film uh, 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 buff, I guess. Uh, but it is ultimately, I think, a very simple, very um, intricate kind of movie, right, that tries to dissect uh, a relationship. I think you're right that it does show some little foreshadowing. Again, this might be something that maybe if I did watch it again, I'd appreciate more of that. Uh, but... I kept sitting there wondering, like, okay, is this supposed to mean something? Is it not supposed to mean something? There's the scene where they're in, uh, I, it'd be, I believe, Jack Palance's uh, office, and they're sitting on this very obnoxiously blue sofa. And I kept thinking to myself, okay, does blue have a symbolic meaning here? What is it? And I kept looking for things like that, <laughs> not sure if, sure if there was or wasn't anything to him, right? Yeah. Um, but I did like how he has the character's move around a lot because I think that gets the sense of uneasiness in this relationship. Uh, you could have them just sort of sit around and yell at each other, which is what usually these kinds of scenes re regress into. Uh, but this one, they don't really have to do much of that. And when they do kind of have an explosion, it's short lived and it just sort of, you know, disappears even within the own conversation. I mean, it's not like the, the histrionics you'll find in certain other, 
uh, movies of this nature where people are throwing things and uh, you're just becoming violent towards each other. It's just announcing of frustrations, I guess you could say, that is really causing this situation to keep spiraling the way it does. Uh, so I, I appreciate it for that for that reason. Uh, that I think that it, it, it manages through the blocking of the actors to get, create the sense of the uneasiness and deterioration in the in the uh, film. Yeah, we should probably talk about uh, Jack Palance's character too. I mean, he's clearly meant to be this chauvinistic, grotesque depiction of you know the business minded American, so to speak. I, I think that's. Um, you know his his character is. And obviously, pretty... Paul is Paul is complicit in this and basically bartering his wife to him. Well, and, that, and that's a point of debate, right? I, I think there's some of that. So the real question is why? Well, it seems pretty know? obvious to me. Well, yeah, I, I think. Well, you could call it that, or you could call it indifference, even, or he's even testing her in some way. I think that may be part of it too. Uh, testing how loyal she is to him because he feels that their relationship is on the rocks as it is. Um, and, and Camille, uh, of course, is one source of contempt in the film. She seems to have great contempt for Paul by the end of the film. And there's a few ways you can interpret that, right? You know, is she feeling this way toward Paul because she feels he is selling out? by taking this job, but later on she seems to support um, the idea of him taking uh, the screenwriting role. Uh, is she mad at uh, at him for not being jealous that another man might be trying to hit on her? Uh, is she mad at him for, as you said, using her as kind of a, a bartering chip? Or, um, you know, is she mad at Paul because Paul is clearly, he clearly has a wandering eye as well. So there's a few ways he could go about interpreting uh, her, her contempt for him. And it could be a combination of these things as well. Uh, so I, I think those are honest uh, depictions of how a relationship could dissolve from Godard, right? I, I don't see that, I don't see him being entirely cynical or sarcastic or trolling throughout this whole film. I, I do think he does have a genuine interest in, in these two characters and, and how their relationship uh, is is being destroyed through this process. But at the same time, it is undercut by kind of this tongue-in-cheek tone throughout the whole film. And, you know, with Fritz Lang there, he's... He, he kind of gives an interesting little comedic performance. He almost seems, well, he seems more entertained just by being on set than actually being invested in creating a character. Uh, so kind of reminded me of uh, Truffaut in, in Close Encounters, right, where you have this famous director taking on this role that you wouldn't expect. But, uh, yeah, it's it's difficult to really encapsulate this film you know it's it's one of those films that i think a lot of directors get on that bandwagon of saying oh this is such a great uh example of french new wave and i I think it kind of stands on its own as this anomaly again like i was saying before it it really takes a life of its own because of the more subversive kind of meta quality it has and ultimately the fact that it is maybe trying to do too much at the same time um, waters down the ultimate message of the film. And as you said, it leaves you kind of confused and it leaves you uh, considering what you've seen, but you do wonder if it adds up to very much at the end of the day. It's part of that genre, and we talked about this with Eight and a Half, of movies about movies. And actually, yeah. it, this, I was thinking of Eight and a Half a lot while watching this, but not because they're just the same genre, but also the same year, right? Both 1963. And I just think about how that film really seemed to go to new places with cinema. And I think this one wanted to, but just never could. I mean, it just seems to be like any good bit of meta, uh, you know, the, the meta 
component that you're talking about there. It just sort of seems to be content with that and so satisfied with itself in that that it never actually bothers to say anything. Whereas I think something like Eight and a Half really does start to say things, not just about movies, but about people, about life. Whereas this just sort of says something on the surface, feels like it's being profound, uh, but really isn't, and I think is just so caught up in its form that it forgets to really add much substance. You know, Monica Vitti was at least, I think, auditioned for this film. I, I, My understanding as... is that uh, Godard went and met with her, and supposedly she looked out the window bored during yeah, the Yeah, that's meeting. right. I, I, I heard that, too. And I, I, I am curious, you know, what this film would have been like with her, because I, I think Bridget Bardot does a fine job, but she's very much there for eye candy right i mean you're not getting a lot of dramatic range from her but she's effective for what she's doing but yeah someone like vt i think would have brought some extra dimensions to this film so it's probably too bad that that didn't work out you know there there are some echoes of antonioni in here in, in terms of how Godard shoots objects and, sh- and captures kind of large spaces especially that almost well, that temple-like villa toward the end of the film with the steps and that long platform on top of it really reminded me of Antonioni and some of his sort of brutalist architecture that he likes to uh, to feature in his films. But I think... Yeah, it's tough. I... I just the the fact that there's so much fracturing in terms of the the languages in the film, I think, is another thing that's interesting. The use of translators is very frequent, or the one translator character in particular. Again, Godard is really making the point of kind of this lack of communication or this lack of connection. These language barriers are are exemplified several times throughout the film, and even used as convenient barriers when people don't want to communicate right uh which is kind of interesting you know Prokosh in particular he seems disinterested in getting the translation frequently (laughs) he just kind of waves his hand or just uh wants to move on to another topic but you mentioned the fact that people are always moving and I, I think that's another uh point to make here reminded me of some of Malick's newer films and that people are just constantly walking around and the camera's constantly moving and maybe not even for a particular reason, it's just to, to create more visual interest. And that, that seems to be a theme throughout many of the scenes, especially many of the outdoor scenes. Yeah. It's an interesting point. I didn't really think of the connection with this and Malick's more recent work where it is a lot of people in these domestic situations, kind of walking around, looking off, uh, obviously Malik's is a little bit more elliptic than this, but yeah. I, I do, you know, see the connection definitely there, uh, between these two. Yeah. And the camera here is much more locked off and more traditional dolly shots. Of course, where Malik is using a very different visual style with the steady cam and the very wide angle lenses. But it really did remind me of that, uh, at certain points here. Um, well, yeah. Any other thoughts? I mean, I I think we've kind of covered probably the the scope of the scope of confusion that that this film can represent or that this film presents. Well, I think it's worth at least looking on the first at, uh, at. Yeah, I think looking at this film from the perspective of Godard, right? Uh, by no means am I an expert on Godard. I mean, I've I've seen a number of his movies. Obviously, the more famous ones like Breathless and. Uh, band apart but this uh i think it was of that same era for him in terms of what he was trying to do he was an ambitious person but i don't know that his ambition uh or excuse me i don't know that his talent lived up to his ambition as a director and this would be i think uh, one of the reasons to look at this this way i think that while godard is is certainly trying to think make uh, some important contributions to cinema Unlike somebody like a Truffaut, who was another of the new wave that was very in vogue at the time of this era, he just doesn't seem to have the ability to make the films that he wants to make here. Um, you know, that's not to say all of his films are bad by any means. It's just to say that I think his talent 
isn't there to match the thematic value or the artistic uh, value he wants to bring. Yeah, I, I see Godard as a disruptor of, of form more than anything else, just the form of cinema and the shape narrative can take. I mean, when I, when I think of his films, I guess that's what stands out to me the most. That, to me, there's always something kind of disconnected, though, when it comes to really uh, directing drama in a very effective way, right? Uh, or directing uh, an emotional moment for the maximum impact. There always seems to be, again, a bit of a disconnect to me, but... It's it's about the the showmanship. It's about breaking the rules, uh, redefining the form of of storytelling, the form of of filmmaking, and it's not always effective. I mean, here it, you you do have some fragmentation in the editing as well. There are those points in the film where we're seeing almost like a mini trailer that. Uh, Reencapsulates either scenes we've seen before, or even sometimes it jumps ahead. R- reminded me of, of the limey in that regard. <laughs> we were just talking about the limey yesterday, I guess. Uh, the limey does some of that too, where they they create a little trailer when a character is introduced, and you see bits from not necessarily what we've seen before, but even later in the film, and that that happens in this film too. So Godard is clearly trying to experiment, trying to do new things, but I, I would agree with you, not entirely successful. But there is still something about this film that is, its tone I find to be fascinating, and I do think there's quite a bit to parse through, especially in the context of the state of cinema at the time, uh, but also the production of this film in and of itself and, and the history of of the making of this film, there seems to be many layers of commentary going on. Now, whether or not those are all intentional or whether or not the level of sophistication is there to, to justify that interpretation is probably debatable, but it does make the film, uh, fascinating to think about. Certainly it's, it, you know, because you talk about just about movies in relation to today, I will not imagine that I'm going to see a movie that will make me kind of wonder and, and be challenged by it the way this one was in the sense that I was truly trying to figure out what's he up to. Yeah. Ordinarily, you know exactly what someone's up to in, a, in the making of a film, and it just sort of is there. And it's like, all right, that's what it is, and I don't have to really struggle with it. So to the film's credit, it does make me do that, right? Uh, again, I'm not sure that it's worth the struggle, but I, I appreciate the fact that it at least does engage me and make me kind of wonder what on earth am I watching and what does it mean? Yeah. Well, we can uh, pivot to Criterion's release. So they released this on DVD quite a while ago, and it's out of print currently. I think, pretty sure the, the transfer is not anamorphic, but I might be wrong about that. Uh, I don't own the DVD. I've got the, the Studio Canal Blu-ray but the DVD seems like it had some good features, audio commentary. Uh, there was a conversation between Godard and Fritz Lang uh, made a few years after the release of the film. Looks like a couple of uh, short documentaries showing on-set footage. And I think the Studio Canal release, I don't think it includes those same extra extras. Uh, uh, there was some other material that was made for that release. The uh, the Studio Canal transfer is problematic, and so this is on the Criterion Channel streaming right now as well if people do want to check it out. And it looks like they use the same transfer as the Studio Canal release. There are portions of the film that do drop in quality, uh, so clearly it's a source material problem. I don't know if the original negative for this still exists somewhere, uh, but it would be nice to see a proper 4K restoration at some point because that that Studio Canal Blu-ray could certainly um, be improved. And the fact that it's on the Criterion channel now hopefully indicates maybe Criterion is going to get this back and redo it and re-release it at some point in the near future. That would be nice. But sometimes it seems like they get 
prior out of print titles for streaming only, and we don't necessarily see a new physical release. Um, did, did you see this on on the Criterion Channel, Nate? Or yep, that's where I watched it. So it was my first time with it. Um, so I, I agree with everything you said. Clearly, it's not a, a, a top notch transfer. Um, I don't know how much is because of material or because of of the condition of the the negative or what, but uh, it uh, it is definitely something where you, you could see that if you got a fresh experience with this film print, it would be quite something to behold those those landscapes on the Italian shore, and it would just it would look great in the cinema scope. Yeah, and it's a beautiful looking film overall. I mean, I do like the use of the widescreen frame in this film, and and. Uh, the use of tracking shots and I, it would be nice to see a cleaner restoration though. Um, I don't know. Hopefully it's in the cards in the near future. Cause I think it's, it's worthwhile for this. Um, I, a lot of those studio canal titles, some of them seem to be trickling back to criterion, but they also seem to be holding out on some that, you know, Ron is rumored to come back to criterion Blu-ray soon but i don't know if that's actually going to happen uh, of course third man is still out of print uh so the, there seems to be kind of this push and pull relationship between criterion and, and studio canal it's hard to know what to make of that well nate uh maybe a little shorter conversation than usual but that's all right we'll uh wrap it up with our final thoughts on contempt so i, I think i know what your answer is going to be but uh does this deserve to be in the criterion collection I'm going to say no. Obviously, Godard does, because as a director, he has been influential and important, and he's well represented. There's several other of his releases of his of his work that are in, released in the Criterion collection, and I would support those, but this one, I, I'm going to have to say I don't think it belongs there. Yeah, I'm kind of torn on this one. I, I, I do like the film. I, I Again, I, I, I kind of made that clear, I guess, throughout our conversation. I think there's a lot to find um, interesting uh, or a lot that's interesting about it and a lot to to really sift through when when you sit down and think about it. It's probably not one of Godard's Hallmark films. Um, I, I would say include it, though. I mean, I, I think it's still important enough in his canon to be included and just its place in cinema history insofar as you know this is kind of a uh a real line in the sand so to speak uh commenting on the death of classical cinema and the emergence of the new wave by the very man that helped usher in that change so uh it's something that from a film scholar standpoint seems to be staying the test of time and gets mentioned a lot so uh, I think it's worthy of preservation uh, for those reasons. Well, thanks for listening tonight. Uh, Next month will be the original Godzilla. Have a good evening and keep collecting. I thought we were talking about Roland Emmerich's Godzilla.